there's a woman here tonight. You've been tormented in your sleep. Nightmares, and even as you're between the state of sleeping and being awake, there's, there are these, these, these almost like visions that come of your loved ones being hurt and there's just, there's just been a real torment at night and all throughout the day you walk in this anxiety. Now let me tell you how it works with the Holy Spirit here. I don't play guessing games. I'm not saying maybe you're here. I'm saying I know that I know that I know that you're here. And you can ask my team 100% of the time, the Holy Spirit is accurate. 100% of the time. Every single time, one of two things happens. Either the person responds in that moment and they're set free, or they wait till after the service to find me and say, I should have gone up, but I was nervous because this, this, and this, or I thought maybe it was someone else. And then they leave without having received prayer in the moment that God had ordained. I don't understand all these things and how they work in the Spirit in God's timing, but there's something about responding when that word is spoken. Ma'am, where are you? It's time to be set free. Is that you, ma'am, from the back? Come. Have her stand right here, please. What's your name? Eva Rose Morgan. And how long have you been dealing with these issues? Since last year, right before, say, middle of October. And right before, um, I've been having dreams to where, how do I explain it? Now, now listen, no pressure to share everything. But, but, but I don't want you to feel put on the spot. But, but you can share if you want, but no pressure, okay? So when I'm in my dream and I'm sleeping, I'm there with either one of my children and there's a, I don't want, I don't know how to pronounce, maybe a demonic, like a figure, like a, like a shadowy figure. I saw that. Lift your hands. Everyone pray in the Holy Ghost. Are you a born again believer? Then this will be quick. Everyone keep praying. of the Holy Ghost. Father, in the name of Jesus, break. Break every bondage. That's the power of God. What are you sensing on you right now? Say again. Some, something lifting off of me, like heavy burdenness coming off of me. It's the power of God. Joy, 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 joy unspeakable joy. Whoa. I feel it like electricity moving through me. You feel that too. That's why you're shaking. This is so beautiful. Keep praying for her, church. Lord, let her never, ever, ever again deal with this and raise her children for ministry as she's prayed in the name of Jesus. Wow. Lord, I thank you for your power that has completely set her free. As I laid hands on you right now, I saw like light. You're going to go home and you're going to sleep better than you've ever slept before. You're set free. God bless you. It's simple. It's the simple work of the Holy Ghost. Keep praying in the Spirit. It helps more than you know. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I don't know who you are, but I see ministry in your future. Pardon? Well, come receive it here. Lift your hands. 
Close your eyes. The Lord told me to pull you out and to tell you there's ministry in your future. Closer than you think. Whoa, 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 whoa. Keep praying in the spirit. There was a season where the fire of God was burning. And then a season where you felt like you had fallen away. And then now that you're back pursuing the things of God, the enemy uses that season of having fallen away to tell you that you're disqualified and that you've missed it. But God says, God says that his promises for your life will be fulfilled. And that what the enemy has tried to use to torment you God is going to cause to be a tool in your hand. For you're going to minister deliverance and freedom to those who need to be set free from bondage. I see you laying hands on those with troubled minds. I hear you saying, Lord, I don't just want to do it within the church setting. I want to go out into the streets and reach those who are hurting. And God says, because, because you have surrendered your life, because you have submitted your will to his, giving up dreams that others told you you were crazy for giving up for the things of God. God says, I shall put a double portion anointing on your life and you will watch as miracles manifest through your ministry. You've been looking for confirmation. There it is. And God's people said, Amen. Wow. Beautiful presence of the Lord here, isn't it? Beautiful presence of the Lord. I can feel, I could feel the pool of people on, on the Spirit. It's amazing. Like I can literally feel like a pool of the people. And, and there's a woman here praying for her son. You could just receive. There's a woman here praying for your son. He grew up in the things of God, but right around age 16, he turned, and now he's running in a way that you don't want him to go, and you've been praying, and God says, your prayers are going to be met. There's another one here. There's a man with an injury on his shoulder that he received at work while lifting something. It's your left shoulder. God says, he's going to heal you tonight, and you're going to testify. Thank you, Jesus. I give you the praise and the glory and the honor. They're coming quick, guys. They're coming quick. I, I, I need you to take a moment. Yes, it's wonderful, but take a moment, pray in the Holy Spirit, because it helps me stay grounded. I can't explain it any other way. Thank you, Lord. Oh, my goodness, my goodness. There's someone in ministry, a gentleman. There's a man here tonight. You're in ministry, and, and there's just been this, this it's such a rough season that you asked God just this past week, you asked him if you were really called. And I know this is going to be a tough one to answer. This one may be like pulling teeth because it's a tough one. But you were asking God if you were really called. And, and there, was, there was this really heavy assault on your mind just this past week. And, and there, was, there was this voice in your head that wasn't God and it wasn't you. It was the enemy telling you that maybe it was time to close things down because you weren't seeing the fruit that you wanted to see. Sir, if you would just respond, there's a word God has for you. And I know this one's tough, and I know this one's going to be a little more like, okay, well, it's going to be him. That's you. And it's because of finances. Lift your hands. It's because of finances. Finances and the concern for your family's future. Don't you dare quit. God will judge you for every soul you should have won. Don't you quit. A prophet, a prophet, a prophet. He'll take care of it. He'll take care of it. God will take care of it. There's a couple here tonight. You've been trying to have children. You cannot. You're here tonight. I know it. I know it. I know it. I know it. Where are you? You may say, well, maybe someone else is wanting that. Right over here? Is it someone over here? That's you? Are you, are you, are you here with your husband? Come, both of you. Everyone pray in the Holy Spirit. Everyone pray in the Holy Spirit. 
Both of you lift your hands. Whoa, pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Pick her up, guys. Pat, pick her up. In the name of Jesus. Pray. I speak life in the name of Jesus. I speak the resurrection life of God. Help her up again. Bring him here. Join hands, both of you. Lord, give them a child and they'll give him right back to you. Let this child be raised for your kingdom, I pray. Let this child walk in a mighty anointing. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, we call that miracle down right now. And I speak in the name of Jesus by faith. Agree with me. Let's ask him. Let's ask him a bold prayer. Lord, we're asking that by this time next year, there would be a miracle. That by this time, come on, ask him, ask him, ask him. That by this time next year. We ask it in the name of Jesus. I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Whoa. Wow. Jesus, we give you the honor. Just lift your hands and thank him, church. Say thank you, Jesus. Let them stay there and marinate. You know, my wife Jess and I, the doctors told us our only hope for having a child was IVF. I know they can hear me saying this too. The doctors told me that there was IVF as the option and that was it. But you know, we stood in faith. Actually, I want you guys to stand right there. Listen to me. The couple I just prayed for. Just stand in the aisle right there. Jess and I were told that IVF was our only option. And it was tough to hear that. It was tough to hear that it was very likely not going to happen. After we went through that season, that initial heartache of the trial and the trouble, I remember I told my wife, I said, Jess, we've cried our tears. We felt our heart ache. Now let's pivot and let's start to walk by faith. Don't be afraid to get your hopes up. Don't be afraid. I would rather go the rest of my life believing for a miracle than to stop too soon and get to heaven and find out I should have received it. Only believe. No more fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. In fact, part of this, part of this I see is rooted in the stress and the fear. Part of this is rooted in the stress and the fear. It does things to our bodies we don't even realize. But go in faith now. We pray to prayer. We ask the Lord that by this time next year, that was a prayer of faith is what that was. And that's what we're going to ask him. And if we see this miracle. I want you to come back and I want you to testify. And we're going to continue to pray with them. Amen. <laughs> By the way, my daughter turns three next month. God bless you. Okay, I told you I wanted to take the offering. I'm going to do that now so that we can just clear that out of the way and and move on. And I don't say that in a way that in, I don't mean to say that in a way that would imply that offering is not important. It's very important. Offering is an act of worship. It's just as spiritual as anything else we'll do here tonight. Now, we have to have the proper perspective on this. And you can stay with me, please. We'll have to have the proper perspective on this. Otherwise, things can get pretty, pretty um, unbalanced. And it's been my prayer that God would keep us balanced and that he would keep us centered on Jesus and, and not just do God's work, but to do God's work God's way because it's possible to do God's work the devil's way. And the problem is that so many are doing God's work the devil's way and saying, look at the results when God is looking not just at the results, but at how you got there. 
So we as a ministry have committed to doing this properly. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to challenge God's people. Now, you should not give in response to pressure, nor should you give out of reluctance, nor should you give out of guilt. I say avoid the three Gs. It's guilt is one of them. Greed and gimmicks. We all know the gimmicks, so $77, and in seven days you'll have $7 million. <laughs> or hey, it's 2022, so a seat of $2,022. I'm like, why can't I do $20.22? There are no magic numbers. There are no special years for giving that will increase it. I know you've, some might be offended when I say that, but all that is just religion and superstition that was never based in Scripture. I'm sorry. And we need to stop falling for those kinds of things. But giving is really simple. There's a need. We believe in the cause, and we give to fund that cause, period. Yes, God will provide. In fact, I believe that whether you give or not, God's going to provide for all your needs. Now, now, hold on. Someone say, wait a minute, that, that kind of throws you off. Are you, are you sure you want to take an offering that way? Is that, is that the way to start? Well, well, let me show you something here. Go to 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to read several verses here. I'm going to read verses 7 through 16. 1 Kings 17, 7 through 16. But after the while, the brook dried up. For there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So just as the context setting verse there, we see that there is a famine in the land, that the brook has dried up, that times are hard. And if you look at this situation, you'll find a situation like this at almost any point in history. There is always a reason to not give. I'm not one of those doomsday prophets who takes the opportunity at every negative turn that a nation might have to say that things are coming down. No. Every nation, every society throughout any point in history was facing some type of financial hardship. It will always be the case. In every season. And we get so addicted to fear that we begin to seek out these what I call the, the false prophets, and false prophets to me is like Fox News, CNN, NBC. That's the false prophets. Prophets of Baal declaring things that are just not so. And, and all they're doing is they're, they're pumping fear into society. And I don't believe that fear is the foundation for the believer to live. Now, every generation, every, every 10 years, every five years, there's something to freak out about financially. Oh, the dollar's going to do this. The country's going to do that. Bitcoin's going to do this. Stock market's going to do that. Well, isn't the way the stock market is, isn't that always the way it's been? Up and down? Doesn't the economy go up and down? We have to be careful to not be tossed to and fro by these things. So let me show you something. That's a similar situation they found themselves in. People are starving. People are dying. It's a difficult circumstance. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? You imagine going to this little village, finding a woman who has no husband. She's struggling financially. She's already doing some work and then having the nerve to say, hey, get me some water, please. A little presumptuous if you ask me. Nevertheless, this is what he does because it's what God instructed him to do, much like a preacher taking an offering. Well, David, during these times, don't you consider? Well, absolutely, I consider people who are struggling. That's why I preach what the Bible says concerning finances. Because if you can get over your fear, you can find that there's fruitfulness on the other side. Verse 12, but she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single, oh, excuse me, Go back to verse 10. So he went to Zarephath. As, as he arrived at the gate, he saw, he asked her for water. Now watch this. As she was going to get it, he called her, bring me a bite of bread too. Now this is really presumptuous. Hey, by the way, since you're already going to the kitchen, hey, since you're already going in there and getting me water, why not pick me up a piece of bread too? But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house 
and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. How is that for a Saturday evening plan? We're going to eat this meal and then die. This was not a very positive situation. It was rather bleak. This woman facing certain death in the midst of a famine that would rob them of the sustenance that they needed. This woman now is faced with the choice. Now, it was presumptuous of the prophet to ask, but he was sent by God to say, here's what you need to do. And she says, there's nothing there. And maybe that's a situation you find yourself in. I've been there. I told the story last night, a summary of the way the Lord raised this ministry, at least to where it is today. And it's, I'm not saying we've arrived at any one point, but there is fruit. And that's all thanks to God. But I'm here to tell you that it took faith every step of the way. Because there were some seasons, Steve, you remember, we couldn't even afford to buy pizza for the crew. We had to have them all pitch in. Thanks for ministering, guys. Can everyone pitch in five bucks so we can feed you and thank you? There was a time when there was trouble raising funds. There was a time when there wasn't this much fruitfulness. And we're just now beginning to see it these past four years, the, the budding of this ministry. You're witnessing the very beginning of the thing. This isn't even the midpoint. God is just getting started with his ministry. But I'm here to tell you that every time I thought it was over, every time I thought it was the end, every time I thought there's no way that this can work, God came through. This woman finds herself in a situation where she thinks she's going to die. That's how bad it was. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Now watch this. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Again, presumptuous. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Now watch this very closely because I used to preach this one way, and now I see it the way it is actually written. God corrected my theology on certain things. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and crops grow again. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did he say that if you make me this bread, then you'll have enough flour and oil? No. He told her, don't be afraid because you're not going to run out of flour. You're not going to run out of oil. So then we see that it wasn't a condition for receiving God's provision. Rather, God's provision was the setting for her faith. He never told her, you have to give me the bread and then God will provide for you. He said, you can give me the bread because God will provide. It wasn't conditional. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. Whether you give or not, your children are not going to starve. Whether you give or not, God's going to provide. However, it is a demonstration of faith in that promise when we give. So you see, we don't give to get. We give because we trust that even if we release, there will always be enough. When everyone else around you is panicking, you can rest assured. When everyone else around you is wondering, how can I make this work? You know how you can make this work. Now, we have a big need for our ministry tonight, as we do for every one of these events. You know we do not charge registration for any event. And I just, I, uh, please hear me at my heart, and I don't want to sound uh, self-righteous in any way. I, I, I just, I know that's the way some do it, and I'm not condemning that. So if you know of a ministry who does it, don't say, well, David says you shouldn't charge register. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that's what God told us. And I can tell you, as a ministry that's built on faith, I just don't have it in me to charge at that door. I can't do it. I won't do it. Now, if it was a dinner and you were getting a meal, of course, okay, we'll charge. But how can we ever charge for the Word? I don't want to put any barriers between people and the Word. So, so here's what happens. Now, now we see that there's this, this need in the ministry. 
we throw an event like this. This event costs just as much as any of the conferences that you would go to and pay $250 to get in. Costs just as much, in some cases a little more. So we need your help in funding this event, not so that we can consume on lavishness and so we can... And, I, and again, I believe God prospers his people. There's nothing wrong with being prospered. But, but the purpose of your giving tonight is because you believe in what we're doing. You believe in the effectiveness of this ministry. You believe that the gospel needs to go out. And you, you believe that we need to win souls. That's it. If you believe that, I'm telling you then to do things on this scale, this is what it costs, especially to keep it free and keep it based on free wheel offerings. That's how we do it. So let me challenge you. But as I challenge you, remember two things. One, this is not tied to your healing. And two, this is not a magic number. But we've done the math. We need the average gift in here to be $200. Now, you may say, well, I don't have that. Okay, you don't have that. Do what you can. But those of you who can do more, recognize that there are some here in your row even, maybe two or three people next to you, that can't do the 200 but you could do the thousand. And it is in our togetherness that we meet the need. Here's what you're going to do. Pull out your little pamphlet, and those of you watching online, you're going to give by clicking on the link that they put in the comments section. And I want everyone to participate in this as best they can. They, they have these papers on your seat. Maybe you sat on it. I don't know. There's these papers that, that are under you. Uh, you can find it. There's Jordan, would you hand me one, please, just so I can show them? Now, you watching online don't have this, but you can leave it in the comments section. Uh, here you're going to hold your phone's camera over this QR code and you're going to see what the need is and you're going to see why the average gift needs to be about 200. And if you can't do that, do 100. If you can't do 100, do 50. If you can't do that, do 25. But there, are, there were some people, there was someone in here last night, they sold a five-figure gift. And then someone online gave 5,000. There are some of you in this room tonight that can help to make up for the ones who can't do that. These are recommended amounts. God's not going to strike you down if you don't do it. But I'm here to challenge the people. Let's rally together and let's make this happen and fund it. So you can scan it and you can see that QR code's up there. And again, online, you can click that link that's being put in the comment section. And if you scroll down, what we've done is we've actually put out a very detailed breakdown of where the funds go so that you can see why it costs what it costs, what things cost the most, and where your finances are going. You scroll, there's a little pie chart and everything. I believe in financial accountability as a ministry. And so we want you to know that your support is going to this event, and it'll also help to fund the next event, and then the next one, and the next one. And this is something I believe that God has called us to do. And so I thank you for your giving. So go ahead, you can scan that QR code right there on your phone. And as you give, you can actually watch the progress bar go up. You can see how your giving directly impacts what happens in this ministry. So as you give, you can actually watch that thing begin to fill up. I'm going to challenge you now. Again, many of you can give those amounts. And again, there are a, there's a small group of people in here. You can do those significantly impactful gifts. Again, not for the sake of giving to receive, not for the sake of giving so that we can be blessed, but giving because you believe in what we're doing. We want to do things with excellence and quality. Also, we're going to have ushers pass out the offering envelopes. Would you come? And then we're going to pass out the offering envelopes right now. If you don't want to give by QR code, maybe you want to give by check or cash, um, come and they're going to just, you can give one to each and pass down to the envelopes uh, to each row. You watching online again, Click on that link. And again, guys, all this goes to fund the ministry. After this, I'm going to minister a word on five keys to the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to pray for the sick, and then we're going to pray for every single one of you. A great night ahead of us tonight, but we need to take care of God's house first. We need to make sure that the needs are met so that we can continue doing what we're doing. So envelopes are going around. As you fill out your envelope, please legibly write your name, your address, your contact information so that we can properly process your gift. Make checks payable to David Hernandez Ministries, not to David Hernandez. It doesn't go to me. It goes to the ministry, and the ministry continues with the work that we're doing. Thank you to the online viewer. Of course, I'm seeing those super chats come in, and I appreciate you joining us from around the world. Now, the rest of you, as you're filling out that envelope, 
Um, I'm just going to pray in a moment, but as you're filling out that envelope, I want to encourage you guys to hear from the Holy Spirit. Let Him speak to you. Don't let fear restrict your giving. Don't let fear cause you to withhold. Say within yourself, I will release what God speaks to me to release just for the sake of the gospel, just for the sake of the gospel, that souls might be saved, that people might be impacted, that lives might be transformed. That's why we give. And so as you're preparing your gift, I know they're also preparing behind me. We have a special guest who's going to bless us with some music tonight, people of God. Uh, Jordan Houghton is here with us tonight, and he's going to bless us with uh, beautiful music in just a moment. And we're going to do that as the buckets pass. But I want to give you some time to fill out those envelopes and write legibly. Please, I know we believe in the power of the Holy Ghost, but don't write in tongues. Uh, we might not get the interpretation on that end. Make sure it's nice and clear. And can I just thank you for your giving one more time as, as you continue to fill out those envelopes. Thank you for your support. We don't take it lightly. We know that your giving of your own sacrifice and sustenance and this is something that may not be easy to do, but I can tell you from experience that if you will seek first the kingdom of God, all these things, it was talking about material things, all these things shall be added unto you. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. How many need more time to fill out the envelope? Hopefully you're in the back. Okay, one up here. Just a couple there. So why don't we do this? Can we all just stand, please? Unless you're filling it out, you can just finish that. And whether you gave online or you gave using an envelope, I want you to hold up your envelope. If you don't have an envelope, lift up your hand. I want to pray that religious mindsets would be broken and that you would believe God to prosper you this year. Did you hear what I said? I said, I want to believe that God would prosper you this year. That's biblical. That's biblical. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now for your people, Lord. And I ask you, Father, that you would prosper them, that they might be a blessing to your kingdom. Lord, we pray and we agree that you will give us a harvest of souls that as we sow, knowing that this is going towards your kingdom, I pray that you would cause these finances to be used to destroy the kingdom of darkness. Lord, let people be saved as a result of this ministry. Let them be healed and delivered. Let them be empowered in the name of Jesus. And Lord, bless your people for their giving. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And God's people said, let's give a wonderful, warm welcome to our guest tonight, Jordan Houghton, who's going to come bless us.
you sing that? That you deserve the glory. Ooh, yes, you deserve the glory. Come on, church, would you lift your hands just one more time and say, That you deserve the glory. All the glory, Lord, you deserve the your worship rise in this place tonight. Someone lift up your voice in this place tonight. If you know he's been good to you, lift up a shout. of you tonight want God to use your life powerfully? If you want that watching online, I want you to write that in the comments section, whether you're watching live or on the replay. 
right? I want that. And don't just let that be a comment. Let that be a public declaration of your desire to be a tool in the hand of God. Spend my life for your glory. Well, that's what we want. That's what we want. But there's a price to pay. At the risk of sounding like a martyr, I can tell you there's a price to pay for the anointing on your life. Salvation is free, but the anointing will cost you everything. I'm talking about that beautiful presence that will rest on your life. And I'm not just talking about moving in power. I'm talking about the very dwelling place of God that you become. Not having to look for an atmosphere, but becoming one. Not having to seek after signs, but signs following you. This is the power of the Holy Spirit that can flow through your life. That when people come near to you, they can sense the presence of Jesus carry that glory, to house His presence in such a way that it's remarkable. People can note it on you. That's what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about that costly anointing that so few discover. You know, when you get saved, you lose some ungodly friends. When you start to walk in the anointing, you lose some religious friends, too. And the higher you go with God, sometimes the more lonely it becomes. Now, I'm not advocating for becoming hermits. Don't mistake that alone time with God for a lifestyle of isolation. Do not treat the body of Christ as if they're somehow contaminating your spirituality. Some people have you convinced you're the remnant by isolating from the body. But if you're isolating from the body, you're not the remnant, you're the rebellious. I'm talking about ascending to higher places that people can't go with you in the spirit. I'm not talking about living in isolation. Moses did ascend the mountain and he would go alone but he'd still come back down and be with the people. And so, the scripture says in Luke, go to Luke chapter 14, turn there now. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. I'm going to start at verse number 25. Luke 14, verse 25. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the costs. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Jesus here is talking about the subjection of our will. We don't hear it preached often anymore, but a principle that true believers live by is the principle of the crucified life. The gospel is not about your dreams. The gospel is not about your will. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Not my desires, your desires. Some of us will have to sacrifice certain dreams in order to fulfill God's will. The gospel is not about self-help. It's about self-abandonment. The gospel is not a means to receiving from God. 
It's a life lived unto his glory. Now, Jesus talked about taking up that cross. Jesus talked about laying down your life. And if you're going to be used by God, you're going to have to walk a path of sacrifice and self-denial in order to have power that others cannot access. You must walk as others choose to not walk. A higher level of power does indeed require a higher level of consecration. Something about my generation just doesn't want to believe that there's such a thing as levels to anything. They want it given, handed, and I'm speaking, of course, in generalizations. There are exceptions. But as a whole, society has developed this entitled mentality, and that has slipped into the church world. And we imagine that we should be celebrated for our intentions of serving God rather than actually doing it. I intend on being a great vessel of God. I intend on building a ministry. I intend on being used of God's hand. But what are you doing to actually put yourself in the position of surrender? You want to know the key to the anointing as I talk about these five different aspects of receiving the Holy Spirit's power on your life. The true key, it all comes down to one word. Die. Not literally, lest I be sued, I have to say that. I'm talking spiritually. You have to die. Forget the person you are. You have to become like Christ. So that when people look at you, they don't see you, they see Jesus that they see the presence of God. Now, the Bible says, and this will be our core text, and we're going to pull from this, glean many truths here. Exodus chapter 30. I'm going to read verses 23 through 29. And as I said, this message is for those who want to be used by God, who want to go to that deeper place. All of us have the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 2, 27, Romans 8, 9, Ephesians 1 and 2 make it clear that the Holy Spirit dwells within every believer. But not all of us live in a way that we're accessing that power. And when I talk about growing in levels of the anointing, I'm not talking about receiving more of God's power. You can't do that. All of his power is in you. Rather, I'm talking about greater levels of surrender. It's not about you getting more of the Holy Spirit. It's about the Holy Spirit getting more of you. Exodus 30, verse 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, Collect choice spices, half a pound of myrrh, six and a quarter pounds of fragrant cinnamon, six and a quarter pounds of fragrant calamus, and twelve and a half pounds of cassia, as measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel. Also, get one gallon of olive oil. Like a skilled incense maker, blend these ingredients to make a holy anointing oil. Use this sacred oil to anoint the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the table and all its utensils, the lampstand and all its accessories, the incense altar, the altar of burnt offering, and all its utensils, and the wash basin with its stand. Consecrate them to make them absolutely holy. After this, whatever touches them will become holy. Now, the anointing oil in the Old Testament was used to mark and consecrate certain things. The anointing oil was used ceremoniously to appoint kings and prophets. The anointing oil was used to mark certain items in the tabernacle, making them holy. And while we see the shadow in the Old Testament in the oil, we see the substance in the New Testament of the Spirit. The oil in the Old Testament represents the presence of the Holy Spirit and the uses of that oil speak to us today in New Testament principles. When someone was to be anointed king, as we saw with David, oil was poured over them. When someone was, be, was anointed to be a prophet, oil was poured over them. And this oil was a special marking for it to anoint literally means to smear, to rub onto. 
And when God has anointed an individual, he has rubbed or smeared his nature on them. Kings were anointed. Priests were anointed. Utensils were anointed. And whenever something was anointed, it was marked as consecrated. It was God's announcement to the world saying, this item, this person has been set apart for my purposes. The anointing brought consecration. But as we see in the life of David, the anointing also brought attack. Things like jealousy, hatred, demonic resistance. You step into the anointing God has for you, you're stepping into battle. And this is why we have to take it seriously, because this is not just some power. Look, anyone can have power. Just ask those who will be rejected in Matthew chapter 7. The Bible says they come strutting up to God. Strutting. Fully confident that they'll be accepted. And they are shocked. Their jaws hit the floor when they find that God has rejected them and says, I never knew, yet they moved in power. It shows us one thing that's absolutely terrifying. Jesus will use you even if he doesn't know you. And the reason for this is because the word has power. God will always back his word with power. His word is so powerful that there are miracles behind it even when a hypocrite preaches it. God backs his message with miracles, but only his people are endorsed with his presence. You may wonder, how is it that so-and-so moved in such healings? How is it so-and-so cast out devils? Well, it's because the word has power. And God is faithful to his word. The Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Now, the anointing was used ceremoniously in the Old Testament And we are symbolically anointed with oil today, but actually anointed by the Holy Spirit as Jesus was. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And you know that God anointed, there's that word, smeared his nature with, or or rubbed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And there we see the New Testament connection. Oil represents the Holy Spirit's presence. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. What do we see in the oil? Because just as the Old Testament holds certain revelations in the symbolism of the tabernacle, so we see certain revelations in the symbolism of the oil. Well, first and foremost, and this is the first key to walking in God's power, we see that they used myrrh. Now, this was a gum that would exude from the bark of a shrub Uh, or a small tree was used for medicinal purposes, for purification, embalming. The primary effect of myrrh is its purifying component. Number one, you want to walk in God's power. You want God to use your life. Number one, you have to walk in purity. The enemy is destroying tomorrow's anointing with today's private sin. The enemy is taking out tomorrow's public voices with today's secret sin. It takes a while for sin to have its effect on your life. I heard someone say, I wish I thought of it, But they said that we wouldn't sin if the consequences were paid immediately. When I read that, I thought that's that's so true. Because we can be so short-sighted. Ephesians 5, 1 through 4 says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself us or up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. So often we talk about sexual sin as an issue. But can I tell you, greed is just as big of a problem. 
for those who will be in ministry. Because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. When laying down the foundation of our ministry, we studied many great greats who had gone uh, before us. One of those, of course, the evangelist who impacted the world in ways I can't think of anyone else impacting in modern day, Billy Graham. What an incredible vessel of God, impacting not just a nation, but nations. Now look, having national influence, having worldwide influence, doesn't mean that you're booked in different countries to preach. It means that when you speak, it shifts the course of nations. I've seen it done with, look, I'm preaching here, here, here. God gave me the nations. Well, not yet, because there's a certain authority that has to come first. We were studying the ministry of Billy Graham, and our ministry team sat down, and we've had these discussions, and Billy Graham's team had actually found, after examining several other ministries, three primary areas in which people found themselves the most compromised. Number one, they identified sexual sin as an issue. Number two, they identified power. And number three, they identified greed. So we as a ministry, just like Billy Graham did, we modeled certain protocols in our ministry that would keep us safe from certain things. You try traveling to different countries, and people of God, there are temptations as you do ministry. We've been to hotels, and we had to switch hotels, where they had certain attendants waiting for you in, by the elevators, only to find out later they were prostitutes. Just right there, ready for you, you wouldn't even have known. And so we as a ministry had to establish certain foundations, one of them being that, that as far as on the sexual front, we travel in pairs. Jesus sent them out two by two, and we go two by two, two. <laughs> so my team knows it's two men, two beds, one room. And if we're traveling with a woman, they get their own room. There are no men with women unless they're married. Now, that may sound old school and outdated, but truth does not change. Because, because you have to learn to not just protect yourself from temptation. That's not good enough these days. You, you can't just protect yourself from temptation anymore. You have to protect yourself from accusation, too. This is why you have to live above reproach because the moment someone accuses me of something or someone on my team of something, we could say, no way that happened. We were never alone. Not at any point during the trip. And so these certain things are implemented in terms of finances and power. We've, we've given power to the board. We have accountability. These are things you have to start thinking of now. Because it is indeed today's private sin that destroys tomorrow's public ministry. There is a measure of power, yes, that you can walk in. We discussed this a moment ago as a hypocrite. You can. I've seen it, and I distance myself when I start to see hypocrisy in ministries. I, I want nothing to do with it. I will not have anything to do with it. And sadly, as years go by, you start to see that not everyone is who they say they are. Don't let that be you. Don't become the one that people talk about that way. There has to be purity. And if there's going to be purity, there must be boundaries. Must be rules. Must be. Think about the fact that Jesus went into the desert prepared. Temptation is not an event. It's a process. It's not at the moment that you fall that you fell. It was all the compromises leading up to that moment that ultimately prepared you for that fall. Purity equals power. The power of God upon your life is directly proportionate to the purity within your life. Purity matters, not just gifting, not just charisma, but the character and the nature of Christ in you above reproach. 
If there are things in your life that you need to get right with God, then now is the time to do it. Don't mistake God's grace and mercy and patience for God's permission. You want God to use you? You desire a good thing. Take care of those little things. The scripture says, those little foxes that spoil the vine. Those tiny things, seemingly insignificant, are what over time destroy you. That's number one. Number two, we see cinnamon. This represents sweetness, not bitter. Now, when I studied this, I was amazed because... Whenever we say, oh, so-and-so is bitter, what we mean is we're upset with them and that's the best way we can criticize them. Isn't it funny that we spiritualize sometimes our own flesh? So when someone, when someone upsets us or we get angry, you get in an argument, it's not that maybe you were just being a little impatient. It's, oh, they're in the flesh or, oh, they got a bad spirit and so forth. And it's that type of shifting of the blame that causes you to not be able to see your own flaws. But I studied this and I found that bitterness biblically speaking, is not just this holding of grudges. It's not just not being able to forgive. It's not just keeping a list of all the wrong. It's not just being super touchy and defensive and moody because of past hurts. That's part of it. You should not walk in that. And if you do walk in that, it'll come out in your preaching. This is why you hear preachers, all they can preach on is their haters. Everything comes back to their haters. Always. Why? Because it, it, that, that, that they're bleeding all over you. Because that's what's really bugging them. And that type of bitterness starts to build in your heart. On a side note, you want to know what to do with critics. Just do what Jesus did. Be silent. I really sense, this isn't in my notes, but I sense this is for someone in ministry. Be silent. Because arguing with some people it's like trying to punch a swamp or quicksand. Every movement just takes you deeper. Everything you say can and will be used against you. If you say they're lying, they say you're gaslighting. If you say that it's not true what they're saying, they're saying, oh, they're being manipulative. If you try to explain yourself, they say, look, they're trying to get out of it. There's nothing you can say to convince certain critics, so just be quiet. I'm serious. This is for someone in here. You're in ministry, and, and when people start to talk about you, they make videos on you. They, trust me, they, they'll get at different angles, and it, it can get ugly. But you've got to learn to just ignore that and let God take care of it. Silence is powerful, but that, that, that was not in the notes, but that's a ministry tip, I suppose. But I'm looking at this idea of bitterness, and I actually saw something that astonished me. Acts chapter 8. Look at how the scripture defines bitterness. Acts chapter 8. This is when the disciples confront a sorcerer, Peter and John, confront a sorcerer who had demonic power. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. This is verse 15 of Acts 8. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these new believers in the name of Jesus, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw, watch this, this is the sorcerer, he's looking at them now. When Simon saw the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Now watch the response. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts for I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Pray to the Lord for me, Simon exclaimed that these terrible things you said won't happen to me. Here we see that this sorcerer wants the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, he wants something good, but he wants it for the wrong reasons. He wasn't rebuked for wanting the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why the disciples 
were laying hands on people because they said, I want the power of the Holy Spirit. But Simon wanted the power of the Holy Spirit primarily because it would boost his status. Here's the problem with ministry today. Some people don't treat ministry like service. They treat it as a means to make themselves important. Preachers are not celebrities. We're servants. Now, I understand that God raises some. I have friends who've been raised and are very well known around the world. Nothing wrong with that because with influence comes notoriety. But the problem is that some people get into ministry not for how they can be used by God, not for how they can help others, not for how they can serve, but rather for how they can bolster their status and be celebrated by man. And this is what Simon the sorcerer wanted. Not only did he want it, he was jealous of what Peter and John had. That will destroy your ministry. Very few things can destroy ministry like jealousy. The bitterness being described here is jealousy. It's competition. It's comparison. Who has more views? Who has more subscribers? Who got more likes on their Instagram? I say, who cares? hundred years from now, no one's going to remember us anyway. I'm telling you that today. About in a hundred years, as, as, as wonderful and fruitful as this ministry may be, I said, hundred years from now, it will be maybe a footnote in some charismatic history. Maybe. You can't even tell me some of the preachers from the last few decades. This is why we have to recognize that it's fleeting and if our motives are not pure, there is bitterness. Look at Mark chapter 11, verse 25. Let me show you something. Mark eleven twenty-five. 25. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. That bitterness begins to affect your prayers. Here's the scary thing, guys. When that anointing begins to weaken on your life, again, not lose the anointing, but the influence of the anointing that you access begins to weaken. When that anointing begins to weaken on your life, you're the last one to notice it. People can see when preachers are preaching out of competition, out of bitterness, out of jealousy, out of hurt. And I'm not just talking about preachers. I'm talking about anyone who wants to be used for the glory of God. This is a trap the enemy uses it's comparison, it's competition, it's this idea of having to have more. We have to stop looking at other ministries and other people being used by God as competition and start looking at them for what they are, their kingdom family. You know, sometimes these points of bitterness are manifested in very sneaky ways. One way I've noticed is the discerners. I have the gift of discernment. If you did, you wouldn't have to announce it. And the problem is that we mistake the gift of discernment for criticism. And here's what happens. People who become jealous of other ministries, they've got nothing bad to say, so what do they say? Well, I don't know. Something just doesn't sit right in my spirit. Can I be real with you tonight? Discernment is not vague. The Holy Spirit wouldn't just say, hey, there's something not right. I won't tell you what it is, but something. <laughs> something just didn't sit right. No, you're jealous. I don't know. Something seemed off. Something about that. I heard, I've heard this. Something about their eyes. Their eyes? And what's happening is they're judging based on natural means, not realizing that that's actually jealousy in them. You'd be surprised how many ministers we dismiss. I told this story before. We, I had a friend who I worked really hard with on getting him on a certain Christian broadcast because I knew that that Christian audience on that broadcast would work perfect with his ministry. Like I knew if we get this guy 
on that program, his ministry would blow up. So I worked like three years on it. Remember that, Steve? I was like, I felt, I felt like I was his manager or like his agent or something. I, 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 can, I, I always told myself, you know, if I wanted to, I could be agents for ministries because I, I like to open doors for others too. Sometimes I'll kick the doors down. So I'm calling this ministry. Hey, you got to have this guy. 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 And finally, we get him on. And it's wonderful to see the influence that began to develop. They had him on the program. They bring him on the screen. I remember the night they premiered it. It was a premiere on Facebook, and it was like a live premiere of this interview. And I'm watching this, and I'm looking at the comments coming in, seeing the people being encouraged. How oh, it was wonderful. I was seeing someone saying, oh, my gosh, this blessed me. Oh, my goodness, my life has changed. Oh, my goodness, this gives me a break. People putting the crying emojis. I don't know if they were really crying, but they were crying in the Internet. And, and so they're, they're putting these live stream comments, and, and I'm watching them going, yes, like I'm excited. Like, yes, his ministry is, 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 is finally, I felt in that moment, I just felt like finally there's a light shining on this ministry that was, seemed hidden for so long. And, and many of you know the ministry, but, but that's besides the point. And I'm watching these comments, and then one person, I call them like keyboard warriors or internet apostles or Facebook theologians, right? It's on there, and I can just see them typing real angry. Well, I don't know. Something just doesn't sit right in my spirit. And then another person jumps on there and says, you know what? I was thinking the same thing. So now these two discerners found each other, and now they're discerning together, but they can't discern. They're not actually walking in discernment. And now one person's critique is validated because one other person was grumpy too. They get together. They start typing this on this guy. Oh, I knew it. And then, and then before long, there's a thread under this person's thread, and all the miserable, bitter people found each other. And I'm watching this unfold, and they feel validated because someone else didn't like them. And I'm thinking these people are judging based on the appearance or upon maybe his look or maybe how he sounds because maybe he's a little too bold for some people. And I was, I was really, I felt like it was righteous indignation. I was really stirred up about this. Like, how could these people just do that? And the Holy Spirit quickened me. And he said, how many people are you doing that to? You see, if somebody wrote something nasty about me online, you would go, like if they said, oh, he's false because blah, 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 whatever he says on money or it's always money or miracles, one of those two. Because he's false because of what he said about money. You would say, no, I've been in the meeting, right? You would know that you, but, but here's the problem. If someone says that about some, somebody you don't know, you're more quick to believe it. How many wonderful ministries are we missing out on simply because of this spirit of jealousy and bitterness floating around in the body of Christ? Jealousy and bitterness destroy your ministry. Not others. God will preserve them, your own. And I've had to make this commitment in my heart to where even if I don't know right away, I don't rush to judgment anymore. I sit back, I watch, I pray. And even if someone's a little different, even if their personality is a little odd to me, even if they do have crazy eyes, <laughs> I recognize that those things aren't really central. That's number two. And I'll move to the next three briefly because I want to pray for as many of you as possible tonight. Number three, Kelamus or cane. This was an oriental plant called the sweet flag. And I have written here, it's knotted stalk is cut and dried and reduced to powder. It forms an ingredient in the most precious perfumes. 2 Corinthians 2.15. Our lives are Christ-like fragrances, rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. The lives that we live come up to God like an offering. Number three is worship. Now, you've heard it said, worship is not just a song, it's a lifestyle. True. But biblically speaking, worship is also a song. Music is spiritual. 
Music has the power to open the soul. That's why when people listen to ungodly music, the music opens the soul, and then those lyrics can go deeper. That's why people become tormented when listening to ungodly music. Because their soul was open, and the word spoken can go deeper. That's why the enemy uses it. But music can also be a lifestyle. And I'm talking about worship now. Songs being sung to, that's a command, all of us to sing hymns. Now, I can't sing, but I can worship. There's something about that lifestyle of walking in that atmosphere of worship. Well, it's why King David had favor on him. It's why the scripture calls him a man after God's own heart, because he was constantly before the Lord in worship. Worship is a state of being wowed by God. It's my being reacting to God's being. The greatness of who he is. The splendor of his majesty. This is what worship is. To see his glory as I give him glory. There's something about being awed with God. There's something about being wowed by God. It's a natural response of a revelation of who he is that causes you to cry out. That's true worship. John 4, 24, they who worship must worship in spirit and truth. Why both? Because truth is revelation and you cannot worship without a revelation. You can clap without a revelation. You can sing without a revelation. You can jump up and down without a revelation, but you cannot worship without a revelation. This is why I'm not fond of drill sergeant worship leaders who scream at people and get angry because they're not responding to their gift and try to make people feel guilty for not adding to the atmosphere that makes them look anointed. I don't see people jumping. Where's your, why aren't you waving? Shouting at the people, not responding. Why? There's no spirit there. You couldn't force people to worship if you tried. Now, you can instruct them to lift their hands and help guide them along, but you can't force them. Because... because if they haven't captured a glimpse of who God is, then their spirit's not really responding. But once you, it's just the opposite. If someone hasn't caught a glimpse of who God is, there's nothing you can do to get them to worship. Again, you can have them jump up and down and create the hype you want. But when they capture that revelation, there's no stopping that worship. When they capture the revelation of the glory of his majesty, when they see with eyes of the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit causes them to catch a glimpse of the face of Jesus in all his glory, worship begins to pour out of them and there's nothing they can do to stop it. They begin to sing and they begin to dance. They begin to praise him. They adore him and they worship him. This is the power of true worship. You want to walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you better be a worshiper. I can't stand it when I see someone come up and preach, and then when the worship's on, they're not worshiping. Don't ever trust a preacher who doesn't worship. Now, they don't have to jump, they don't have to dance. I can't. But they need to worship. I watch people. People don't know this, but I've watched people who, who were um, prospective connections in ministry. And during the worship, maybe family emergency. I'm not saying everyone who texts is of the devil, okay? But maybe a family emergency, okay. But during the worship, back and forth, in and out of the service, just disinterested. Oh, but when it came time for them to minister, that's when they start. It tells me it's not a lifestyle, it's a performance. Don't trust a preacher who doesn't worship in the worship service, and don't trust a worship leader who doesn't sit in the preaching. Because it's performance. We're getting real tonight, aren't we? <laughs> well, not that we're fake other nights, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> worship marks you. Even the worship that doesn't feel heavenly at times marks you. 
there's something about being able to worship even when you don't feel it. Do you know why that's so important? Because I think we, we, get, we get the wrong perspective. We treat worship like it's therapy for self. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be in worship to experience the effects of worship. That's beautiful. I don't want to be religious and say, that's not what it's for. But we have this mindset, oh, I've had such a rough week. I can't wait to get in there and worship. Well, the idea is that it's for you. Worship isn't for us, though it positively affects us. You will experience wonderful effects when you worship because you're in the presence of God. But, but how much more pricey, how much more beautiful is that costly worship in the seasons when you don't feel it? Stop waiting for your emotions to tell you what you should know by faith. You're stuck in ministry. You're stuck in fruitfulness. You're stuck in your calling. Worship your way through that. You praise God every step of the way. That's what I would do. I would praise God for the 30 viewers like they were the million viewers. I would praise God for the $100 like it was $100,000, and sometimes it sure felt like it. We were so broke. <laughs> Worship through those seasons. Worship when the people love you and when the people hate you. Worship when the people understand you and when they misunderstand you. Worship when the ministry's growing and when the ministry's shrinking. Worship when you see the effects and when you don't see the effects. The problem is we deem success as if it's results. When it's not results, it's simple obedience. And in that obedience, we find that heart of worship that says, God, whatever is going on around me, it doesn't matter because of the beauty of who you are. The beauty of who you are. Number four. Acacia, or roots. These roots would go deep, the root, roots of, of an herb that would go deep into the soil, and that's where it would get its nutrients, and that's where it would get its properties that were used in the making of the oil. This represents to us the process of your roots going deep. Now, sometimes I think we mistake consistency for faithfulness, and they're not the same. Consistency is repetition. Faithfulness is attitude. Consistency is doing again and again and again and showing up and showing up and showing up. Faithfulness is showing up with the right heart, right perspective, right attitude. I've known a lot of Christians who've been in ministry consistently but not faithfully. And I don't say that to slam anyone. This isn't to cause anyone to be offended. This is to wake you up. Because God wants to use you. God wants to bless you with fruitfulness. But there has to be a process. Psalm 1, 1 through 3 describes the believer as one who is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Too many people want to skip the process. Can I tell you something wonderful about this day and age? The great thing about today is that anyone, because of social media and the internet, anyone can have a platform. That's a great thing. You want to know the terrible thing about today? Is that anyone, because of social media and the internet, can have a platform. <laughs> Self-appointed prophets, rogue evangelists, they say they don't attend a church because they couldn't find one as spiritual as they wanted it to be. What they really mean is that they couldn't find the church that would put up with their nonsense and they kept being held accountable. Wanting to skip the process, we actually damage our future. Nothing will slow you down more than a shortcut. And if you rush the process, all you've done is put yourself in a place that you weren't ready to handle. The process is to serve in humility, to connect to the body. That's part of the process. If there's one thing what this pandemic has done to the church on a mass scale is it's caused an exodus of people. I am the body. I am the body. I am the body. No! 
The scripture teaches that you're the body when you come together. The hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. And that's exactly what we do when we say, I am the body. The foot leaving and saying, I am the body. No, now you're just a foot and you left the body. The process of connectivity, the process of fellowship, the process of character development. You can preach, but are you pure? You have a gift, but do you walk in glory? You know how to move in power, but do you carry the presence? These are things you have to ask yourself. The process sometimes is difficult, but it's necessary. And then be consistent for the sake of obedience. Final point. Number five, the olive oil. Now, you've heard it said that when the olive is crushed, and all of us have heard this by now, when the olive is crushed, that it produces oil. And it's in that crushing of the olive that there is this production of what we see as sacred. But do you realize that before the olive could be crushed, it had to first be shaken from the tree? I don't know about you, but I've experienced things in ministry that made me frustrated with God. I'm just going to be honest with you. You've all heard the saying, he's never early, he's never late, he's always... I don't like that phrase. <laughs> because I say, Lord, I wouldn't mind if you were early now and then. And it's like, he won't wait until the bill is due. He'll wait until they're about to shut the power off. And then the check will come in. And then the finances will come. And I say, Lord, why do you do that? Why do you wait until the very last second to show up the way you do. And I was frustrated with them. I said, Lord, I put faith in you. I'm publicly out there saying I'm trusting in you. What are they going to say about you if I don't make it? Do you know why the Lord does that? It's so that when the miracle comes, you know who gets the glory. Oh, I tried everything. I exhausted my effort. I applied my intellect. I implemented my strategy. I reached deep emotionally and mentally. I focused. I made the connections. I did all I knew to do, but only God can do it. And this is where the shaking comes in. When the economy began to do what it did in this recent season, people began to become afraid. But that just showed me that the reason people became afraid was because their faith all along was in a system and not in God. Oh, we, we love our systems. We rely upon our systems. I remember there was a season of ministry. We first started to see that fruitfulness, miracles happening, finances coming in for the vision, and we were able to expand and go all over the world, and things were coming in for the television studio, and all these connections were happening. It got down to the point where we were able to just line by line know what was happening next, and the Holy Spirit told me, since when does it take no faith to operate a healing ministry? God will shake you from the familiar, and then he'll crush you. God will shake you from the systems upon which you rely, and then he'll crush you. Now, it's not that the oil appears in the olive when it's being crushed. It's that it's revealed when it's crushed. Pressure shows us what's in you. The pressure alone doesn't produce the anointing. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen tragically, I've seen friends lose their minds because of ministry. And when I say lose their minds, I mean they went to another place because of ministry. Why? Because, because they, they tried to do it on their own. They were relying on something else. But God will shake you from things. And maybe that's you right now. You're in a season of shaking. You're in a season where everything around you seems to be falling apart. The systems that you relied upon, no longer reliable. The things that you marked in your mind as familiar, no longer familiar. God's shaking you 
and he's crushing you. You know what crushing is? It's betrayal. It's heartache. It's challenge. It's struggle. It's those nights where you're wondering, looking, going, God, I don't see how you're going to do this. But it's also in this season that God himself wants to show you that he's still the God who makes a way where there seems to be no way. That he's still the God of miracles. That he's still the God of healing. Now, I want to minister to those who need healing in their body. We're going we're gonna to do that right now, and then afterwards I'm going to lay hands on God's people. But let's do sort of like a, a mini altar call here just to seal the message. You're in this place, and anything in this message spoke to you, and you're saying, God, I'm ready to lay my life down. Just stand up right in your seat. And you watching online, your altar call is simple. You're ready to do this? Just say, I surrender. Type those two words, I surrender. You're in this place, you want that. Make this your altar call. Just stand up. Wow. There's a beautiful presence of the Holy Spirit here right now. A beautiful presence of the Holy Spirit. Lift your hands. God's doing some deep works right now. Wow. God's doing deep works right now. Everyone lift your voices softly, begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. Softly begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. Say the simple word, say, Lord, use me. Can you guys cast that out of her, please? Just do it quickly now. Thank you. There's a, there's a different flow here. It should take no more than 10, 15 seconds, guys. Is she free? Okay, good. Everyone praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit's being very clear with me right now on what to do, and I have to obey Him. Wow. The Lord is calling you back. Some of you, you left the ministry, and God's calling you back. I want you for the next two minutes to lift your hands and pray out loud boldly in the Holy Ghost. Go. Robert Preston. Stand right here. Fresh oil. Fresh oil. Fresh oil. Everyone pray in the Holy Ghost. Fresh oil. Fresh oil. Fresh oil. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Oh, no robo sente yende bebe bebe sente. Prophet Jordan, would you come? Lift your hands. Fresh oil and provision. And provision. Fresh oil and provision. Fresh oil and provision. Conto robo sente yende rebebeke. Sente yende bebe koto.
Wow, wow, wow. Jesus. Everyone all across the room, lift your hands. Spirit, keep praying, keep praying. Just another minute or so. Come on your robo omnipotent Father of mercy and grace. Thou art well. of the Holy Spirit it's touching each one you watching online you standing here in this building now remember this all things are possible only believe I sense a strong healing flow right now Lord I thank you that we're going to be amazed at the healing miracles we see tonight Confirm your word with signs following, I pray. And do as only you can do, Lord. It's not in my touch, it's in yours. So we come to you, Lord, hands lifted and eyes closed. We come to you knowing that you are the healer. Father, I by faith step into the mantle that was imparted on my life. By faith, I step into the mantle that was imparted on my life, Lord. And I do it with my eyes fixed on you, knowing that you are the healer. You are the God of miracles. And I thank you, Father, that sickness has lost its power in this room. And we command it to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we take authority over the prince demon, over the principality. Guys, there's such such a strong anointing here. I can feel it all over my body right now. Thank you, Jesus. This is so holy. This is 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 holy. In the name of Jesus, I come against the work of every demon of hell. Lord, you came to destroy the works of the devil. And sickness is a work of the devil. We break its power here now tonight. Cancer, go in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you now. Tumors, I rebuke you now. I want you by faith to place your hand over the part of your body where you need healing. 
just as a point of contact here, some of you are going to feel like electric currents moving through your body. Others are going to feel like heat. I'm not saying that to suggest it. I'm saying that because I don't want anybody freaking out. We've had people run out of the building when this starts happening. Some will feel like heat come on you. Others like a weight. Some may feel nothing at all, but the sickness will go. And you'll notice that the pain has left your body. He's the same Jesus who walked the shores of Galilee. See him now. See him now. Jesus, the Son of the living God. Clothed in majesty. Angelic hosts surround him. Singing his praise and his worship. Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see who is in the room with us. His face shines like the sun. The brightness of his countenance, too brilliant to behold. And when he speaks, it's like the sound of many waters. His very voice shakes the foundations of the earth. He is Jesus, the Son of the living God, the Alpha, the Omega, beginning and the end, Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. The very same who touched the lepers and caused them to be healed. The one who spoke to Jairus' daughter caused her to rise from the dead. The Messiah, the Christ, who drove out demons with a simple command. With one touch healing all who were sick. The lame, they walked and would leap for joy. The blind would see, and the first face they would see was the face of Jesus. The one who opened the ears of the deaf. Surely the God who formed you can heal you. And he stands before you now. What love would you see in his eyes if he were to look at you today? What power would you feel surging through his hand? He is here. He is alive, the resurrected Lord, the one we declare. And he reaches out to you now. He won't reject you. He won't turn you away. He's sweet and he's kind and he's compassionate. See him now, church. See him now. Holy Spirit, open our eyes. Open our eyes to see him standing in the room with us. All the angels are crying holy to the Lamb who sits upon the throne. Holy, holy, God Almighty, to the Lamb who sits upon the throne. All the angels, they're crying holy to the Lamb who sits upon the throne. 
hands lifted, eyes closed now, hallelujah. In. Worship him now, church. The healer is here tonight. Making you whole, making you whole, making you whole. Reach out and touch the hem of his garment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See him at God's right hand. Start moving, start moving. If there was a pain in your shoulder, your arm, your leg, your back, start testing for that healing right now. Check for the tumor. Check for the skin disease. Check for the pain. Check your eyes. Check your ears. Miracles have taken place. And as you check in faith, you're going to find that the miracle is done. Lift your voices and sing it again. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your healing touch. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Give me the glory, Lord. We give you the glory. 
Hallelujah. I'm telling you, healing virtue just went through this room. So what I want you to do, I'm not just saying that for fun. Test yourself. I've had so many people say, I didn't test myself because I didn't think it would happen for me. And then as they were leaving and when they got in the car, they found out they were healed. Check your body in faith right now. It's a step of faith. And you're going to find the tumor is gone. You're going to find the skin cleared up. You're going to find your hearing is healed. Your eyes are healed. The pain is gone. God is a miracle working God. Now watch this. If you believe God's power just moved through this room and you, you sense the presence of God, just wave at me like this as we worshiped. Look at that. There was a wave that went through. Now watch this. If you checked yourself and you believe God healed you, be bold about it. Wave if you believe God healed you. Look at all those healings across him. Here's what I need. Everyone who's waving right now, who's been healed and has checked themselves, come right where this guy here is waving his hands. Come out of your seat. What you're going to do is you're going to testify. Now, I know that you may be going, oh, I don't know about that. I'm a little nervous. I understand. But remember, somebody may be watching this tonight that gets encouraged by your healing testimony. Someone in this room may hear your story and go, oh, that can happen for me. And some people have dealt with things for so long, they don't even realize that it's actually a pretty big deal that they've been healed. Like some girl last night, her eyes were healed. She said she's been dealing with blurriness for years. She says, I know it's not a big deal, but my eyes are healed. I'm like, that's a pretty big deal. But you've dealt with the sickness for so long that you don't even realize. So you coming out of your seat to testify is going to touch people all around the world. So I challenge you, please don't hoard the miracle. Come out of your seat, big or small, strange or common. Whatever the healing is, come out of your seat, come testify. The rest of you, are you ready to see what the Lord did tonight? Are you ready? And you, you may take your seats. You watching online, if God has healed your body, I want you to leave your testimony in the comment section. Because that healing virtue flows even after the live stream is done. And you may be watching this six months from now, and you may also be healed. Look at that line of people, guys. All of them received a healing tonight. And to God be the glory. Now let me ask you, did you see me lay hands on any of them? You know why? Because it's not in my touch. It's in his. It's in his. What happened here, Sergio? Diga, this is patience. She's been having problems with her vocal cords. And since the last November, she's been having throbbing and pain. She even came with pain and throbbing. And the whole time where you were speaking, it was throbbing, there was pain. But during the time of worship, and you said, test it, begin to see if it's gone, she had her hand on her throat, and she said she felt uh, pain, uh, the pain begin to decrease and go. And tonight, she's believed she's been healed. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise for that. Now, how do you know that you were healed tonight? Uh, because I had pain even while you were speaking, and um, the, it, it, there's no pain. And while they were singing hallelujah, I started to sing, and there's no pain. And how long had you been dealing with that? Um, I've had problems with it since last November. and the last couple months, I haven't been able to sing much at all. But you were singing here tonight. Let me ask you something. What did you sense as the Lord was healing you? Uh, just like overwhelming peace. And I even felt heat in my throat. Lift your hands. That's the presence of God here. That's the presence of the Lord here. Did you see that come on her right now? I'm telling you, listen to me now. Lest I be judged by God himself. It's not me. It's who's around me. He's with me. He's with all of us. But there is a, a manifestation. I can't explain it. I don't know why it happens. I couldn't tell you when it started, but in our ministry, people feel like these, look at her, she's shaking. People feel like these currents of electricity. I don't know why God chooses to move like that in our services. Miracles help resolve a problem. Signs point to Jesus. And wonders, they just make you wonder sometimes. And I wonder what this is, but maybe the Lord will explain it to me when I go stand before him. I got to ask you, what did you just sense go through your body right now? 
electricity just I'm sh- <laughs> it's the real deal it's the real deal it's the real deal up here tonight guys and the people said amen what happened here Ruben Tiga I have Reina here with her mother Reina two years ago was in a roller skate accident and she injured her back she actually injured her tailbone she said for two years now has had pain Earlier during service, when it was time for prayer, she said she felt heat and a tingling sensation on her tailbone. She said now she has no more pain. She's able to sit properly without feeling any sort of pain whatsoever. Can you tell me about that? Uh, yeah, I can. It felt like, the, I don't know, really know how to explain it. It felt like. So before, it felt like that my tailbone was, like, sore all the time. It felt like that it was just really bad. Was it a lot of pain for you? Yes, a lot of pain. And what happened tonight while you were, you were singing and worshiping Jesus? When I was sitting and worshiping Jesus, I felt my tailbone just really heat up. It and it started vibrating a little. And the pain went away? Yeah. It did. You know who did that for you? Jesus. That's right. Jesus did that for you. And you're the mom? So what was, how bad was the issue? Uh, every time she'd sit down for like more than an hour, it hurt her. So like, tonight was hurting her. Both of you lift your hands. Stretch your hands toward them, guys. Look at the little girl. She's shaking. Guys, guys, guys. Help. Sometimes it's difficult to get up in this. Say that again. My legs are real weak. That happens up here. What did you feel go through you right now? Say again. Electricity. How about you? Electricity. Was it awesome? Yeah. Well, you guys rejoice and go walking in that healing power. What happened here, Sergio? Diga, this is Michelle. For the last three years, she's been dealing with irregular heart rates. Even when just sitting there, her heart rate would just jump up to 120. Even today, she came in and it was just going crazy. And she said, as we began to worship, she said she felt this electricity. It was like jolting on her heart as she had her hand there. And she said, I have no words to explain it. But all I can explain, it was a shock. And she said she feels calm. Even the anxiety went down. She said it's completely gone. What does this mean for you that the Lord did this? It's just a confirmation he's awesome and that he does heal. Lord, thank you for the anointing. Whoa. It's a beautiful flow here tonight in Orlando, Florida. Wow. And Lord, let her never deal with anxiety again. Let her get hold of it in Jesus' name. Tearing down that stronghold. Tearing down that stronghold in Jesus' name. What happened here? David, I have Mindy here. Two years ago, she got in a car accident. And she said, ever since then, she's had bulging discs in her back. She said, pain. She said, a week ago, she reached over to her bedside to grab something. And she said, she heard her entire spine just crack. And she said, she's been in per- terrible pain for a week now. She said, earlier today, she felt the presence of God. And she said, she randomly just noticed the pain was no longer there. And also, two weeks ago, she's had, she caused arthritis on her, right sh- on her right wrist. She said, she hasn't been able to move it properly. She said, if she would just move it for a little bit. Even if I was to bend it this way, it was, I would feel sharp pain. Like, I don't feel nothing now. I even came with a little brace here, and I, I don't feel nothing. Really? You left the brace in your seat? It's in your purse. You put the brace back in the purse. And now tell me what happened with your back. But I had a car accident, like, about two and a half years ago, probably. And I have, like, all my 
disc on my back. I have bulging disc. So like a week ago, I had reached over to get something on the other side of my bed and my whole spine cracked. I literally heard the crack. And I've been like with back pains for like a week now. But when you said test yourself, I, I bend, I even moved and I don't feel no pain. Well, that's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. He's here on the platform with us. Can you feel that? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, touch this woman now. Oh, that's beautiful. Wow. This is something else here, guys. And glory, glory to This is Kumar. For the last 10 years, he's been battling diabetes and it even messed with his pancreas. Filling on you, sir. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Electricity. Uh, it looks like a Jesus just jump start my pancreas to two hours and. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh. Oh. Say again. What's your testimony? Lift your hands. Yeah. Same thing I did 25 years back. I was watching TV, and I, I saw people got healed by Benny Hinn was praying. And uh, I said, I want to, you know. I, you got, did you get saved? Yes. So I said, I want Benny Hinn to uh, touch me because I didn't know Jesus at that time. And so lady called, a lady on the phone says, okay, so you mean Jesus? I said, yes. And, and you gave your heart to the Lord. That is, this is a man who converted and gave his heart to Jesus. In 25 years, he says, he's been living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, God bless you, sir. Go rejoicing in your miracle. What happened here, Rube? Diga, I have Jim here who served in the Army, and he said in 2007, he injured his left elbow. He said he's gone through multiple surgeries ever since. He said recently in 2020, he went through surgery where he lost feeling in his left elbow and in his arm, right, in his uh, hand right here. You lost the feeling? Yes. It was like all pins and needles through my hand and no feeling whatsoever. And here, it's like a constant novocaine in my elbow. What happened tonight? I felt the nerves slide and all the feeling came back. Say, say it one more time for me because I want to make sure I heard you correctly. I felt my nerves slide and then all feeling came back. Church, that's a creative miracle. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise for this? Wow. Isn't this beautiful? What are you sensing? Just, I can't explain it. You want more? Lift your hands. Overwhelm, overwhelm him, overwhelm him. Wow. <laughs> Help him back here. Help him back here. What, what, tell me what happened here. <laughs> it's like water to the knees. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? Lord, do it again in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I love God's power, man. 
I love God's power. Sergio, what happened? Diga, this is Abil. Last week, she injured her knee. She even went to the emergency room. They gave her crutches. She even came in limping today. And how she could describe it is she laid hands all over her. Start over. Tell me the story while she lies there. So she came in limping. And as you said, begin to lay hands on yourself and test it out. She laid hands on her knees and she said, I can't explain what I felt. All I knew is after I laid hands, it was gone. That's all she knows. Wow. What did you feel go through you right now? (laughs) This is the real deal here tonight, guys. I'm telling you. This is the real deal here tonight. Isn't this beautiful? Lord, thank you. Let her receive a double portion tonight in Jesus' name. Wow. I I don't know if anybody enjoys this as much as I do. I get like a front row view of their faces. I hope you guys are seeing that because that is, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing to witness God touching his people. And you watching online, which one, which one are you, my guy? You watching online, it can happen for you too. This same anointing here is flowing through and touching you right where you are. Ruben, what happened? Diga, I have Beth here. Beth had to go under, undergo a C-section six weeks ago. She said ever since then, she had pain all over her body. She hasn't been able to even bend over properly. And she said today, she was noticing that her bones began to feel loose. And she said, I was able to gain motion all over my body now. She said, there's no more pain. Awesome. So tell me about that moment that God healed you. Um, I just felt, when I was worshiping, I felt like I was just being lifted up completely. Like I was literally the only person in this room. And I was spinning. I was telling the guy how to open my eyes just to make sure that I was in one spot still. (laughs) I've had those moments. You expect to look around and see the throne room. And so then after you sense the Lord doing this, you check your body and what did you discover? My muscles just feel completely loose. Like this morning when I tried to put my shoes on, it was an extreme task. I could barely bend down just to buckle my shoes. Now I can bend over and touch my toes. My muscles are loose. Like I just feel... There's like light over your head. Like a glory. Lift your hands and say, Lord, let her drink, 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 drink. Now I see these things. If you wonder what a vision is like, I don't see them with my physical eyes. Sometimes, yes. But it's almost, I can't explain it. It's like, you know, like when you're daydreaming and you get lost in a thought? It's like, and it's kind of like, your eyes don't stop working, but you kind of like retreat into your mind and you can see something else. It's the best way I can explain it. But I see like light over her head. There, there, there's, there's, there's a, a visitation that the Lord is doing with her now. It's marking her. I see even prophetic stirrings in her happening. God's really doing something deep in her right now. So can we just be reverent for the moment? Stretch your hands toward our sister as she lies there. And just pray softly in the, in the, in the Holy Spirit right now. Thank you, Lord. 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 Beautiful presence here. Beautiful, very, very reverently, guys. I don't want to disturb her right now. Help her, help her. You're, you got favor with God, I'm telling you. Uh, you have such favor with God. I, I, there's, he's, he's doing something beautiful with you. Something so beautiful. And, and we're, we're, we're glad to see it, amen? You go rejoicing and let the Lord use you. What happened here, Sergio? Diga, this is Zaida. For the last six months, she's been having neck pain, and it's been affecting even her arm to lift up. She could only lift up halfway, but she said during worship, she had her hand on her neck, and she said she felt a pump electricity, and she was able to lift her hand all the way up, and the pain is completely gone. I believe in my God. I have all my faith is in my God. That's right. So show us now, how far were you able to go first? Right about where? Where, where would your arm stop? Right there? And then now? No pain. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jesus, for this healing touch. We give you the glory and the honor. The, 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 the look on their faces, they're such sweet people. Such sweet people. Okay, one more. Let me see what happened here, Ruben. And just let her marinate there on the platform. Giga, I have Judith here who gained complete hearing in her left ear. Wait, 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 said, wait, 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 wait. Say that again. Today, Judith gained her hearing back from her left ear. She has been having this problem for 20 years now. She was struck in her left ear 20 years ago. She said ever since then, the hearing has been muffled. And she said during prayer, she just started noticing out of nowhere, the room just got all loud out of a sudden. She said she now hears properly out of her left ear. Can we give Jesus a mighty hand of praise? Are you serious? So and, and in fact, I stood uh, for the Lord's healing of my sister who has cancer. I, I, I was praying for my sister and, and suddenly... You know, that happens so often where people are praying for other people and, and in praying for other people, they suddenly experience their own healing miracle. And that's, that's what's happening here. You were just so focused on praying for your sister and then that healing miracle manifested in you. And so, so tell me, you're, you're worshiping, and then suddenly what? It's, uh, and it's, it's not, uh, like now the sound is so very, very loud, you know, because normally I hear, I hear it then normal because with my right ear, but my left ear, I... I... Come here, come here, come here, come here. Stand right here, face them. Let's see, I want you to cover your good ear. Cover your, what was your good ear? Hold this. Yes, yes, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, I am healed, hallelujah. Can we give Jesus a mighty hand of praise? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's our resurrected Lord, and He still heals the sick. He still opens the eyes of the blind. He still opens the ears of the deaf because Jesus is alive and well. 